I? (laughs) What am I doing here? What am I supposed to be doing here? Has anybody ever wondered that besides me? I think we can all come to a place in our life at at different times where we said, you know, what is this all about? You know, why am I here on earth? What is my purpose? What am I supposed to be doing? Have you ever felt like you were just kind of floundering around and that the enemy was pushing you from pillar to post, back and forth, and you felt like your your faith was vacillating? Well, today's message is entitled, Who Am I? I'm going to tell you who you are today because the Bible, God's Word, tells us who we are. We may have all felt like at times, at points in our life, like that, but we find, but when we find out who Christ is, we will never um, fully understand where our place is or what we're supposed to be doing until we have that relationship with Jesus Christ. When we know who we are in Christ, it changes everything. We will begin to live with purpose and become fulfilled in our lives. I'm going to say that again. When we discover who we are in Jesus Christ, it will change everything about your life. You will begin to live with purpose every single day, day by day. You know that you have a destiny. You know that God has something in store for you. And so you begin to step and walk purposely every day. We don't have to flounder around and wonder what our purpose is. God has a plan and a purpose for each of our lives. Well, the first thing that we need to know when we get saved is that we are no longer the same person. How many of you know that? That when you receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you are no longer the same person. You are somebody totally new. You're not somebody who's turned over a new leaf. You're not somebody who's decided to start over. You are a new creation in Christ Jesus. Brand new. Now let's look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. It says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ. Can everybody say that? Anyone? Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. So what has passed away? The old things. O-L-D. Old. Old things. And what has become new? All things. A-L-L. All things have become new. You know, the word new in the Bible is a very interesting word. There's, it's translated two ways in the Greek. The first one is neos. Neos refers to something that's just been made, but there are already many others in, exi- in existence just like it. For example, a new car. You know, when they manufactured your car in your make, model, year, and color, they probably manufactured a hundred more just like it, right? When you go to the dealership, don't you see the same car? They're brand new. They're exactly the same. Sometimes they're in the same color. Sometimes they're in different color. But it's a new car, right? That's Neos. We are not like a new car. God did not manufacture another Liza. There is no other Liza but Liza. (laughs) God did not manufacture another Nora. There's only one Nora, and that's you. But let's look at the other meaning of new. But in this verse, all things become new. It's kainos. Kainos means something just made which is unlike anything else in existence. Nothing like it. When you come to Jesus Christ, you are a complete, unique creation in Him. You're not even the same old person that was born into this world. You become born again in a brand new creation. All the old was passed away and everything has become new. 
In Christ, we are made entirely new creation. There is no one in existence just like you. You are unique and a special creation to God. You know, God put us on this earth to live with purpose. Have you ever asked yourself, what's my purpose? I mean, we all have many different purposes, and my purpose might not be exactly the same as your purpose, but there is one purpose that it says in the Bible that all of us can fall under, every single one of us. And that's found in 2 Corinthians 5, 18 and 19. We're going to keep on reading in that same chapter. It says, now all things are of God. It's ringing, John D. Now all things are of God, who has reconciled us to himself through Christ Jesus and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them, and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Your purpose is to reconcile others to Christ. You might be a doctor, you might be a lawyer, you might be a school teacher, you might be a housewife, you might own your own business, you might be unemployed, that doesn't matter. Your purpose is to reconcile others to Christ. As we were reconciled to him, we, our purpose is to lead others to Jesus Christ. That's one of our main purposes in the earth that we can all identify with as the new creation. How many of you are a new creation today? Then your purpose is to bring others to Christ, to bring reconciliation. It says, and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them, and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Now let's look in verse 20. Did you know that you are to represent Christ wherever you go? It says in verse 20, Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God were pleading through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. We are an ambassador for Christ. What is an ambassador? An ambassador is someone who's sent from our nation to another nation to represent the United States. We are a representative of Christ. We are an ambassador wherever we go. Have you ever... I'll have to raise my hand on this. (laughs) Have you ever about lost your temper and wanted to say something that wasn't very kind, and then all of a sudden you notice somebody you go to church with? And you think, boy, I'm sure glad that I behaved myself, (laughs) that I held my tongue, that I was kind. Because we represent Christ wherever we go. What kind of representation would that be? If we go into a restaurant and we treat the waitress with disdain, like she's beneath us or he is beneath us, that if we complain about everything, what kind of ambassador is that? What kind of ambassador is, is you know, giving the bird when somebody cuts you off or, or cussing a blue streak when you slam your, hum, your thumb with a hammer? We are being watched The apostle said, we are epistles read by all. Whether you like it or not, if you're an ambassador for Christ, you got eyes on you with binoculars. We were at my daughter's house last night and my niece, Sailor, and um, I guess her cousin-in-law, if you want to call it that, (laughs) from the other side of the family was there and they had binoculars and they were outside looking at hummingbirds up close. They were observing the hummingbirds. But you know, we are an ambassador wherever we go. You know, when we step into a place, the king of kings just walked in. 
because we are the carrier of Jesus Christ. We're the carrier of the Holy Spirit. And we don't want to grieve him. When we walk into a place, it should light up because we brought Christ with us. People shouldn't want, people shouldn't say, oh my gosh, here she comes. You know, and they want to go the other direction because they don't, <laughs> they're like, oh no, 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 no. I don't want to talk to her today. I don't want to talk to him today. All he can do is complain. We don't want to be that person. God's created us to be an ambassador, to represent him in the right way. So we're a new creation, not like anything else, not like a brand new car, but totally unique. We are to reconcile others back to Christ, and we are an ambassador for him. Who are you? Are you getting a picture of who you are? Amen. Somebody got a revelation over here. <laughs> now let's look at Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1. It says, Once you were dead because of your disobedience and your many sins, you used to live in sin just like the rest of the world, obeying the devil, the commander of the powers of the unseen world. He is the spirit at work in the hearts of those who refuse to obey God. All of us used to be that way, following the passionate desires and inclinations of our sinful nature. But our very nature, we, excuse me, by our very nature, we were subject to God's anger, just like everyone else. But God, everybody say, but God. I love it in the Bible when it says, but God. But God is so rich in mercy, and he loved us so much that even though we were dead because of our sins, he gave us life when he raised Christ from the dead. It was only by God's grace that you have been saved. For he raised us from the dead along with Christ and seated us with him in heavenly realms because we are united with Christ Jesus. You were destined to be seated in the heavenly realm with Jesus Christ. We were destined to go right into the presence of God. It says that we can come boldly before his throne of grace to obtain mercy and to find grace in our time of need. We were created to be reconciled to Christ and to sit with him in heavenly places. What does that mean, that we're going to go and, and sit next to Jesus? Well, someday. But what does that mean right now? How do we do that right now? That's coming into his presence. That's praying heaven down on earth. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We're seated with him in the heavenly realms because we are united with Christ. We were appointed for good works. Did you know that you were appointed for good works? It says in Ephesians 2.10. Just go on down to, the, to verse 10. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Workmanship. It also says masterpiece in some translations. I love that that we are God's masterpiece, his workmanship. You know, if we give God our fragmented life, he can make something so beautiful out of it. Amen. Has anyone ever seen a, a tile or ceramic mosaic, like up on a wall or maybe out in the patio or something? It's made with broken pieces of tile. They're just shards of tile, broken. But the person who lays it, they get them and they put it all together and they shape it until it looks like something. And when you stand back and you look at it, it's like, wow, that's amazing. What a masterpiece that is. And that's exactly what God does with us. When we accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, we become that new creation. And he takes all of the fragmented 
pieces of our life and he puts them together to make a beautiful masterpiece. You know, the devil might be telling you that you're no good, that you're not gonna amount to anything, that you're nobody. But I'll tell you something, if you're in Christ, you are a somebody. You are a masterpiece. Maybe you don't feel like a masterpiece this morning. Maybe you don't feel like a beautiful mosaic. I want to tell you, come to the cross. Come to Jesus. He'll take the fragmented pieces of your life and put them together and make it beautiful. It says in Isaiah that he gives beauty for ashes. How can you do anything with ashes? Ashes, you just, you just, and they're gone in the wind. You can't unburn something. You can't. You can't reverse the process that made ashes. But God can. God can if we'll allow him to, if we'll give him the brokenness of our heart and the broken pieces of our life, he can turn your ashes into beauty. He can give you the oil of joy for mourning and a garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. Are you walking around in depression, heavy of heart? If we will praise him and turn to him, he will give us that garment of praise that will displace all of the heaviness and depression and sorrow and loneliness that we're feeling. You are his workmanship, created for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. You know, God said of Jeremiah, I knew you before you were born. I knew you in your mother's womb. God is saying that to you today, that he knew you before you were even born. And he predestined you to walk in good works. Now, we don't do good works to be saved. We do good works because we are saved. Because we love God, we want to to show that love to other people. But we were destined. That's one of your purposes. You were destined to do good works in the earth. Who are you? Are you getting a picture of who you are this morning? You are a child of God. And as a child of God, you have special privileges. (laughs) How many of you were the teacher's pet in school? If you were the teacher's pet, you knew that you got special privileges. I want to tell you, you are God's pet. (laughs) You are the apple of his eye. He loves you so much, you're his favorite. But don't tell the person sitting next to you. Mona always tells me, no, no, I'm his favorite. Right, Mona? (laughs) I'm his favorite. But the secret is we're all his favorite, all of us. But because we are children of God, we have special privileges. What are they? John chapter 1, verse 12. But as many as receive him, to them he gave the right to become children of God to those who believe in his name. Galatians 3, 26 through 29. For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ then you are Abraham's seed and the heirs according to the promise. As a child of God, we are heir to all the promises that are in God's word. These are the special privileges that you have. 
They are from cover to cover. And you will never know what your special privileges are until you get in the word of God and find out what they are. Because when you know what they are, you can start to appropriate them. I have to tell you this story. My husband and I went on a cruise for our 25th wedding anniversary six years ago. We went on one just recently for our 31st. But the first time we ever went on a cruise was for our 25th wedding anniversary. And we went to this beautiful dining hall. And they gave us a menu with all kinds of stuff. And it's really hard to make a choice. You could pick an appetizer, an entree, and a dessert. And of course, they bring bread to the table and unlimited iced tea and water and stuff. And it's just... It's yummy. And so you're sitting there and we're like, oh, I don't know what I'm going to have. Okay, tonight I'm going to have the, the steak. Tomorrow I'm going to have the shrimp. And so the first couple of nights we were just choosing. Has anybody ever been on a cruise? Raise your hand. Okay, you know where I'm going with this, right? <laughs> so we picked, and, we picked and chose, you know, what we wanted the first few nights. The third night, our, our waiter, we had our own special waiter. He used to come and make these uh, little napkins and all kinds of uh, animal shapes for us and he was such a, a nice man he was I think from New Zealand or something anyway he said you know you don't have to pick and choose you can order anything on the menu and we looked at each other like what you mean I can have steak and shrimp and I can have this appetizer and that appetizer I don't have to choose he said, no, you can have everything on the menu. I said, hot dog. <laughs> we didn't eat a hot dog, though. <laughs> we ate just about everything on that menu. Then we had to go on a massive diet when we got back. But I'm telling you, you can pick anything off of the menu. You have special privileges. You're an heir to the throne of the most high God. You are a joint heir with Jesus Christ. You were created to sit in heavenly places, not only when we die and go to heaven, but now. Heaven on earth, now. Finances, now. Health, now. His glory, now. You have special privileges. Did you know that there, are, there is more to you than meets the eye? Don't you love getting to know people? You know, you just first meet them, you shake their hand, you know, you, you get a first impression. Sometimes it's good, sometimes it's not so good, right? <laughs> and, uh, but then when you get to know a person, then you can really decide if this is somebody you want to be, be close with because you really get to know them intimately. There is more to us than meets the eye. There's more inside of us. There's so much more to being a child of God than meets the eye. It says in Romans 8, 37, Yet in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Did you know that you are more than a conqueror? How can you be more than a conqueror? I mean, if you conquered, you conquered, right? Right? No, more than a conqueror is you conquered, but you took all the land, you took all the spoil and the booty too. You took it all. You're more than a conqueror. Yeah. Romans 8, 31. If God is for us, who can be against us? I don't know what you're walking through today. You may have all of hell unleashed against you, but if God be for you, who can be against you? Yeah. 1 John 4, 4, you are of God, little children, and have overcome them because he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. The Holy Spirit lives inside of us. We are carriers of the glory of God. How amazing and awesome is that? You are more than meets the eye, more than meets the eye. You have so much inside of you, so much potential, so much destiny, ready to just be released in you. Did you know that you're a royal priesthood? In 1 Peter 2, 9, it says, But you are a cho chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, who once were not a people but, that, but are now the people of God, who had not obtained mercy but now 
have obtained mercy. You are a chosen generation. You are a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's own special people. Did you know that you're a branch? Jesus said that, that I'm the vine and you are the branches. My father is the vine dresser. It says in John 15, 5, I am the vine and you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. And without me, you can do nothing. We are part of a family of God. You know, when we're wandering around, who am I? Many times we feel lost. We feel like we don't belong anywhere. That's the number one people reason that people join gangs or types of organizations is because they want to feel a part of something. Know that you are a part of Abundant Grace Community Church. This is your family. You are a part of a greater family, the body of Christ. You are a part of Jesus Christ. He's the vine and you're the branch. You're the extension of his arms and his feet. You are, their ex you are the extension of his mouth. You're a branch. Hallelujah. It says in 1 Corinthians eleven twelve 12 that we're part of the body. Verse 12, as the body is one and has many members, but all the members of that one, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. Skip down to verse 15. If the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I am not of the body, it is therefore not of the body. And if the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? If the whole body were an eye, where would the hearing be? And if the whole were hearing, where would the smelling be? But now God has set each member, each of them, in the body just as he pleases. And if they were all, excuse me, and if they were all, one member, where would the body be? We're a branch. Each of us is a different branch. Each of us is a different piece of the body of Christ. But we belong as a believer. We have a belonging. We have that sense of belonging in Christ. Who are you? You belong. It says in Psalm 139 that you are fearfully and wonderfully made. There is nobody like you. God knows all the hairs on your head. He knows the foods you like and dislike. He knows your favorite color. He knows what floats your boat and what aggravates you. <laughs> Verse 14, it says, You made all of the delicate inner parts of my body and knit me together in my mother's womb womb. Thank you for making me so wonderfully complex. Your workmanship is marvelous. There's that word again, workmanship. How well I know it. You watched me as I was being formed in utter seclusion, as I was woven together in the dark of the womb. You saw me before I was born. Every day of my life was recorded in your book. Every moment was laid out before a single day had passed. How precious are your thoughts about me, O oh God. They cannot be numbered. I can't even count them. They outnumber the grains of sand. And when I wake up, you are still with me. Who are you? You are fearfully and wonderfully made. And that your soul knows right well. God has awesome thoughts towards you. And he's planned your life out and even written it in a book. You know, you might not feel that you're fearfully and wonderfully made. Maybe you grew up in a household where you were put down for your appearance or your weight or because you didn't accomplish this or accomplish that. I think we can all identify with something along those lines where we had insecurities and low self-esteem in areas of our life. But God has put this in his word through his psalmist David to let us know how unique and how special each and every one of us are. Kids, you are the way you are because God made you like that. 
You have brown hair because he loves brown hair. You have blonde hair because he loves blonde hair. You're in the family you're in because he knew you would be the perfect fit. God loves you. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. God is faithful to complete the good work that he started in you. You might say, as we've been going over these points this morning of who you are in Christ, you might say, you know what, I, I don't really feel like that, not, not yet. I want to encourage you that God won't leave you unfinished. God never starts a project and just walks away. Sometimes we walk away because we don't like the molding and the shaping because sometimes it's a little bit painful. So we walk away, but he's always there. The potter's always there to perfect the clay. And it says in Philippians 1, 6, I am certain that God, who begun the good work within you, will continue his work until it is finally finished on the day when Christ Jesus returns. Hey, none of us have arrived yet because Jesus has not returned. He says that he's going to continue to finish the work in us until the day that Jesus comes back. We're all at different places and different stations in our life. But be encouraged today that he will not leave you where you're at. He will finish the good work that he started in you. Many of you feel just this call from God to do something and to go out and to, to minister or to reach out in people. But you don't have the, the way yet to do it. But he will not leave you. He will finish the good work that he started in you. And when he calls you, he will equip you, send you, and anoint you. You don't have to worry about it. He'll make the way for you this morning. So finding out who we really are. Finding it out who we really are all starts with having a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Did you know that God chose you? We think that we chose him, right? But really, he chose us. And he's given us the free will to decide if we want to come or not. If we want to say yes or if we want to say no. But he is the one that chooses us. It says in John 15, 16, You did not choose me, but I chose you. And I appointed you that you should go and bear fruit. And that your fruit should remain. That whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give you. There is your purpose. He chose you. He appointed you that you would go and bear fruit and that you would have fruit that remains and that whatever you ask in my name, the Father will do it for you. That's some pretty awesome privileges of the King, isn't it? Amen. Amen. So to know who we are starts with having a born-again relationship with Jesus Christ. Now today, I want to give you that opportunity to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Maybe you've never made that commitment. Maybe you have heard of Jesus. Maybe you have always believed in God, even believed in Jesus. But you never prayed to ask him to come into your life and to wash away your sins. Maybe you're a person who used to walk with God but you walked away. You feel like you're one of his uncompleted projects. If you feel like you're an, an incomplete project because you went and did your own thing, but you're ready to come back and say, you know what, I know you chose me, I say yes. I say yes today. Would you finish the good work that you started in me? Would you cause me to be just like it says here in Ephesians chapter 2, that I would be... Um, Set apart for your good works, Father God, anointed. In John 15, 16, excuse me. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should remain, that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give you. 
I want to invite you right now. I'm going to come down to the front. And if you would like to pray with me today to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, I'm going to ask you to go ahead and come down here. Father, I thank you for each and every person that's in the sound of my voice, Lord. Father, I know that you're dealing with each and every heart today. Father, you're drawing people with your cords of love. You're just pulling them in. If you're feeling that pulling on your heart that I need to give my life to the Lord, I need to let him finish the good work that he started in me. I'm, I'm an incomplete project. I say yes today. If that's you, would you just come up here with me right now? Would you come on up and let me pray for you? Are there any people today that want to receive Jesus for the first time? Or you want to come back to the Lord? Today's the day of salvation. The Word of God says not to harden our hearts. But when you feel Him tugging, that's the time. That's the time. Is there anyone? I believe that there is. Sometimes it's hard to be the first one to break out of your pew and to come down to the front. If you're sitting next to somebody, ask them if they want to go to the front and tell them you'll go with them, that you'll come with them. Anybody today. I know that the Lord has encouraged you with his word to know what a special person that you are and that he has a wonderful life planned for you. He wants you to know who you are. He doesn't want you to walk around in wonder and to flounder around and be pushed from pillar to post and vacillate back and forth. He wants you to know who you are today. Amen. Praise the Lord. Anyone else? Anyone else today? Amen. Any children, any men or women? God bless you. God bless you. God bless you, sweetheart. Thanks for coming. Man, what's your name? Amanda. Amanda. What's your name? Vicente. Vicente. Is there anyone else that wants to come before we pray? I don't want you to miss out. Today's the day of salvation. Come on up. Bless these children. What's your name, hon? Michael. My son's name is Michael, too. Do you know what Michael means? It means like God. That's a pretty powerful name, right? Amen. God loves you, Michael. Best decision you'll ever make in your whole life. Liza has a word. I'm going to go ahead and let her give that. Go ahead. Thank you, Joanna. Hallelujah. As we were, Joanna was praying and encouraging the people to come up. I heard the Holy Spirit drop a word, and I want to be obedient to that. I hear the Lord say, there are some of you and many of you who have received me into your heart. But your prayer life is stagnant, says the Lord. And your passion for my word has become dull and numb, says the Lord. And I am encouraging you today to come forth so I can reignite that passion for prayer and for my word. I hear the Lord say, for those who seek me will find me. Hallelujah. And there are many here that are going through many things in their life. But it is the power of prayer and the passion for the presence of the Lord that's going to break that thing over your life. So the Lord is wanting me to encourage you. If you are in a valley of stagnation, when was the last time that you sought the Lord fervently in prayer on a daily basis? God does not want us lukewarm. He wants us passionate, fervent, and hot for him. Hallelujah. He says the lukewarm he's going to spew out of his mouth. He is coming back for a bride without wrinkle, without spot, who is holy. 
And God wants you to know he is here to break every yoke. He is here to reignite that passion for him. Amen. And if you have lost your fervor and passion for prayer, you have lost the first love of your salvation. And God says, I want you to burn hot for me. And I want to reignite the love and the passion that you first had when you first came to me. And if that is you, hallelujah, the Holy Spirit is here to pour out into your life and give you that grace, that fervor, and that love again, that we may experience the fullness of God. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. That bears witness with me, Liza. If that's you today, respond to the word. Respond to the word. When a word goes forth, there's always a, a response that we're to give. Let's respond to the word today. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord. God sees each and every one of you, sees your heart. He sees your desire to be closer to him and to have that fire rekindled in you and to draw near to him. And if we draw near to him, he will draw near to us. So thank you for responding to the prophetic word because when God speaks something and you respond, God will do it. He will do it. First of all, we're going to pray for those that want salvation this morning. These dear people came up to dedicate their lives to Jesus Christ. If there's anybody else in this crowd here and you want to pray to receive Jesus Christ, would you just pray right along with me? Can you say this? Say, Heavenly Father, I thank you for your son, Jesus. Thank you that he died on the cross for my sins. I ask you to forgive me for all of my sins in word, in thought, in deed, and in attitude. Cleanse me with the blood of Jesus. Renew a right spirit within me. Come into my life. Be my Lord and Savior. Write my name in the Lamb's Book of Life. Thank you for saving me and loving me today. In Jesus' name, amen. Now we're going to pray together for that, that, that fire. For those of us that want that fire rekindled in us. I want my fire burning brighter brighter than ever. I want to be in his word more. I want to be in prayer more. We can all use an increase, including myself. We all need more. So let's pray together. Let's lift up our hands before him today. Say, Father God, in the name of Jesus, I just submit myself to you and to your will. Father, forgive me for being lax in seeking you, in prayer, and in the word. Father, I ask you to just wipe my slate clean. Let me start over afresh and anew today. Uh, just fan the flames of the, the fire of God in me that I might burn brighter and hotter for you. Increase my desire to pray and seek your face, to be in your presence, and to read your word. Help me, Lord, not to fall back into my old ways, but to continue to grow and to move forward in my relationship with you. Thank you, Father God. 
In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You may be seated. It's good to get right with the Lord, amen? It's good to pray and have that fire stoked in us that we might burn hotter and brighter. Just tell the Holy Spirit, throw another log on the fire. Just throw another log on the fire. Keep it going. <laughs> well, I wanna bless you today as we leave. Would you stand up and just grab a hand there next to you? I wanna pronounce a blessing over you and a blessing for the person on your right and on your left. Say it with me. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you. Be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. In Jesus' name, amen.